Can you hear that? That is the sound of terror. Let's hear it again. It is also, not coincidentally, the sound of money. Really? That's great. This is a particularly unnerving scene from the movie A Quiet Place, one of the year's biggest box office success stories. Written and directed by the office star John Krasinski, A Quiet Place is the latest in a long line of horror movies to find big audiences eager to be scared. It earned $50 million in its opening weekend, on its way to $188 million this year. And it's the only movie among the 25 highest grossers of the year that is not based on a previously existing property of any kind. In other words, it's original. That's one of horror's powers, its ability to reinvent itself. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And after last year's It and Get Out, and this year's The Nun and Halloween, we are living through an explosion of horror movies at the box office. In a time dominated by superheroes, CGI dinosaurs, and animated kids' movies, it's scary movies that have been able to persist while dramas, rom-coms, thrillers, and teen movies have faded from the popular imagination. Understanding why is simple. Horror makes us feel and demands our attention, and they're so much more effective when seen in theaters than anywhere else. With no second screens to distract us, there's nothing to keep us from fear itself. But have you ever stopped to ask yourself why these movies scare you in the first place? That's our big question. Just what makes a horror movie scary? These are the five keys to making audiences sick. Number one, sound, score, and silence. What we hear is infinitely more important than what we see. Sure, that pool of blood pouring down an elevator shaft in The Shining is disturbing. Now watch that blood flow without Penderecki's ominous score. Weird, but not so terrifying, right? In a quiet place, the absence of sound makes us lean in closer, more attuned to the tension in the story of a world where monsters can only find their human prey if they make enough noise. It's a neat trick. In the opening segment of Wes Craven's 1996 classic Scream, Drew Barrymore throws a tin of Jiffy Pop on the stove. Listen to how clearly we can hear the flame and tinfoil expanding in this scene. Uh, hello? Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. What's that noise? Popcorn. Later, when the popcorn really pops, it leads to one of the movie's first big scares, before Barrymore's character is eventually killed. That early tease of the popcorn on the stove, what sound designers call Foley, or the addition of recorded sound effects after the shooting of a film, is essential to building a tension that eventually pays off. It is the primary tool of suspense. And that kill from Scream, of course, was an homage to the infamous shower sequence in Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 masterwork, Psycho. Janet Leigh, who we are led to believe is the star of this movie, is abruptly murdered by the creepy innkeeper of the Bates Motel, played by Anthony Perkins. At about the 40 minute mark, we hear the slashing strings arranged by composer Bernard Herrmann. By now, that score has become a piece of pop cultural history, recreated and parodied hundreds of times over. But set against the original scene, with its meticulously crafted 78 camera setups and 52 cuts, Herman's music is as devastating as ever. Think of other famous sounds. Leatherface firing up the chainsaw in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Freddy Krueger's scraping claws. Darth Vader's breath. All it takes is a few seconds and we're terrorized. Which leads to number two, expectation and timing. Jesus Christ, that alien just exploded out of John Hurt's chest. The genius of Ridley Scott's alien isn't its haunted house in space design, and it isn't Sigourney Weaver's gripping performance as Ellen Ripley, though both of those things are wonderful. It's in the sheer shock that that famous scene provides, the stunning body horror of having something tear us apart from the inside out. We don't know what to expect, and we're all the more terrified because of it. This isn't quite the same thing as the jump scares we discussed earlier. Think of the hand reaching out from the grave at the end of Carrie. I'm talking more broadly about our expectation of a safe and comfortable life. We don't expect an alien mutant to just burst out of our friend's chest. See also the thing. And we certainly don't expect an ancient demon to appear in our dining room. And even if we find ourselves living in a life-threatening simulation that doubles as a meta-commentary on horror movies, we don't expect every movie monster we could ever imagine to appear with the ding of an elevator bank. But that's exactly what happens when all hell literally breaks loose in the cabin in the woods. Yes, we're afraid of the dark, dismemberment, and death but timing is everything. Number three, 
objects. They say the weapon makes the monster. What's Michael Myers without his knife? Or Leatherface without that chainsaw? In the scariest movies, objects represent supernatural or violent power. Something physical we can see that imbues a villain with its evil. Sure, the devil is scary as a concept, but it's when we see the amulet of Pazuzu in The Exorcist that we know Reagan is dealing with one difficult demon. In The Ring, Samara can't be unleashed until you pop that VHS cassette in a VCR. Remember those? In The Evil Dead, the monsters that torment Ash and his pals don't appear until they play a clip in which incantations out of the Necronomicon, the Book of the Dead, are recited conjuring evil Sumerian demons and possessed trees. In Misery, there's that wooden block between James Caan's ankles and the sledgehammer that Kathy Bates swings. Sure, evil is all around, but it needs to take physical form to really do some damage. Number four, performance. We need avatars for our fear. Look at the creeping dread that crawls across Jake Gyllenhaal's face in David Fincher's Zodiac. His character Robert Graysmith has gone down into the basement of a strange man who may or may not be the infamous Zodiac killer. The tension is unbearable. Does that scene work without Gyllenhaal's wide-eyed, jittery acting? Horror may be considered a low-rent genre, but when it gets the actors it deserves, like Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, or Boris Karloff in Frankenstein, or Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs, it can become something bigger. But these movies don't need brand name stars. Remember Heather Donahue? No? How about now? I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. Heather and her teary performance as a tormented documentarian lost in the woods made The Blair Witch Project one of the most original and successful horror phenomenons ever. And then there's number five, psychology. There are simple reasons to be scared. Sharks, demonic possession, the invasion of alien pod people stealing our bodies and our identities. But why are we scared in the first place? Well, there's some science for that. Groovy. A part of our brains, known as the amygdala, can be triggered while watching these movies. According to Wisconsin University professor Joanne Cantor, when we're afraid, this area is shown to be highly active in MRI scans. In those scans, the amygdala's movement coincides with increased heart rate, blood pressure, sweating, and alertness, the same physical responses we have to fear. It's also connected to the hippocampus, where we store our memories so we don't forget to be afraid next time we're presented with an experience like that. This is why even though we've seen 10 Halloween movies, we're ready to pay for an 11th. We remember what it feels like to be so scared, and we can't stop going back, no matter how awful it makes us feel. Mm -hmm.